Okay, so here's the problem. I got my bandsaw set up and it is hooked up to dust collection, but no blast gate. It basically comes out of the back. There's two ports that kind of come to a Y and then just some flex hose here into my dust collector. The flex hose is temporary, or I guess, I don't know, who am I kidding, how, how temporary has it been, maybe a year. Uh, it does meet up with a piece of PVC on the ceiling. Sorry if you're getting dizzy or you get seasick, motion sickness. And that terminates over by my table saw. Um, that's hard plumb down from the ceiling, and there's a couple blast gates on there. One is kind of an auxiliary, uh, it hooks up to my router table when I need it, or just around the floor. Blast gate on the left goes to my table saw, and uh, I guess you could call my dust collection setup utilitarian and simple. It wasn't something I planned out uh, from day one. It was just kind of add branches as I need them, and it's served me pretty well. But back to the point at hand, I don't have a blast gate for my dust collection on my bandsaw. Yes, it's not very far from the actual split at the dust collector, but reaching through there, it would just seem a whole lot better if I was able to mount one of these hot metal blast gates right onto the side of my bandsaw. Uh, I want it kind of up off the floor, that way I'm not bending over to actuate it. I wasn't necessarily sure if I wanted it coming around the back because that way the hose is going to interfere with the fence and the table. But I need a way to secure it to the side of the bandsaw itself. I also wanted it to be somewhat you know, a fixed, a, a positive fixment where it's not going to be wobbling back and forth or it's zip tied and constantly banging into the spine of the saw. So I figured, you know, I'll just tap a couple holes. For those maybe not in the know, these are the kind of the Italian style saws where it's kind of a box beam construction as opposed to your Western style band saws where it's a big cast iron spine. This has got some uh, pretty thick gauge metal, a couple little tap holes in there, isn't going to harm anything. So I figured you guys might want to come along for the ride. Uh, as I kind of work around a simple task in the shop. Built this stool on a live show on my YouTube channel here uh, just the other night. If you guys are into the, the live shenaniganry tomfoolery, you'll definitely have to keep an eye out for those and ring your bell notification if you haven't already, if you want to be up to date. Anyways, back to it. So we have our blast gate, and, and the idea behind this um, was essentially I was going to cut out a relief, the, just a little bit larger than the radius of this collar, and then I can affix this piece of wood uh, via these two holes, and we'll kind of, you know, cobble that together. Let me chop this to length real quick. And for my next trick, I will change the uh, color of my sleeves. Uh, I realized that like two or three days after filming this, that for about three minutes of the video, the audio crapped the bed. So uh, despite popular belief, uh, I know, I, I do change my clothes from time to time. Although I do have workshop clothes, and I do have get dressed up clothes. I think the last time I wore those was at a funeral or a wedding. I guess it's the same thing depending on who you ask. But either way, nothing major about the design choice here, uh, although I did shorten it up. There's a little cutout here for the blast gate. Uh, the only thing worth noting is a little radius, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, if you want to copy the screen here, you can get all the measurements for a standard, uh, you know, whatever it is, four inch blast gate, metal blast gate. But I would just double check to make sure that your screw holes are the exact distance. They might vary from model to model. All right, now with my piece over at the bandsaw to cut out that little notch, uh, there's something worth noting here. Uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but I have a detensioning arm on this particular bandsaw. There's all sorts of different debates online as far as why you want to leave the tension off your blade when in storage. I like to on this one because it's got the quick release or whatever. Uh, I like it because at least that tension's not, you know, making flat spots on your on your bandsaw tires, on your wheels. I've had benchtop ones where I've never detensioned it, but you don't want to start it up and be cutting when this thing is not tensioned. So some people have made this a bright orange handle or they've wrapped a flag around it. Uh, in my shop, the halogen light at least says to me the blade is tensioned. So as soon as the halogen light goes on, the saw gets tensioned. That way, when I shut off all the lights in my shop and then I realize, oh, the bandsaw light's on, that means I forgot to shut off the tension. At least I know at the end. Now let's see how accurate I can cut this circle. And then of course, oddly enough, I normally end up turning the light off when I'm filming these because it pretty much bleaches out everything depending on how my camera gear and stuff wants to operate that day. Yeah, nothing to write home to mom about, but shop project.
Now for the most useless part of the operation, I'm gonna fine tune that bandsaw cut here on the oscillating spindle sander. It's a shop project, it doesn't necessarily need it, you're not gonna see it, but uh, something worth noting, if you think about the grain direction in wood in this particular piece going that direction, my spindle sander runs anti-clockwise, so as it's coming around, picture petting a fur animal, you know, you're gonna wanna pet in one direction for it to be smooth. A lot of times you don't do these layout lines on both sides, so when you come from the apex of that, and then up, you're going against the grain. So what I typically do is I will come right to the line to where I'm starting to kind of sand that pencil line in half, and I'll do my one side in the right grain direction, I'll flip it over and then do a final pass, that way it's smooth throughout. Like I said, not rocket science, but definitely worth noting. Like I said, you could have copied those measurements, but I'll, I'll kind of let you know how I arrived at some of these measurements. That way you can kind of deconstruct it. As far as my screw length that I'm going to use to attach this to the bandsaw, I basically, uh, my, my combination square, I just made that a hair shorter, like eh, two or three threads shorter than that. And then that's where I could lay out essentially that how thick I want that piece to be. That way when we drill our through holes, if you want to add a washer, you literally get just two or three threads. Just, you know, the thickness of that metal. We don't need it poking in there real deep. As far as the offset, I think that one was just, just a hair over an inch. For the corners, I'm gonna drill a hole and I'm gonna use that Forstner bit to get that radii. And I always <laughs> I always find this comical, but a nice little math trick. So if I'm using a three quarter inch diameter bit, people have a tendency like, oh, well, where does the center of that go? Obviously, you know, you can line it up and then kind of turn it and eyeball it pretty good. Try to do fractions in half. And a lot of people don't realize this trick, but the bottom number, just double it. So, you know, what's half of a half? Well, it's a quarter because you doubled the two. Or say, what's half of a, I don't know, a 64th? Uh, 64 times two is 128th. So you come over, if it's three quarter, double the bottom number, three eighths. You come over three eighths in either direction, and then that would essentially find you your, your center point, and that's where we're going to drill those holes to get that inside radius. Speaking of Forstner bits, I have a good set of Forstner bits and a bad set of Forstner bits. And I always tell myself that I keep the bad set of Forstner bits because I guess I would use those for shop projects or whatever. And you would think I would use the cheaper ones on something like this, a shop project, but no, I reach for the good ones. And if you're thinking that this would be easier on a drill press, yeah, you'd probably be right. As long as your drill press didn't look like this, Oh, and that, that back bit, yeah, that's a two and five eighths split point uh, with a Morris taper, because you never know. Back to the bandsaw. Here over at the bandsaw, that should make pretty quick work of making a couple notches in order to take that corner chunk away that the Forstner bit left behind. We'll sneak up on it as close as we can get. And now we can adjust to cut the other one. Yeah, not too bad. There appears to be a light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, I am in uh, no mood to necessarily bring up a debate amongst the crafty crowd in their shops on the weekends, but I've always wondered, where did I put that other spin? Oh, there it is. I've always wondered what percentage of people like just tinkering, you know, building their shops more and more. I guess it's just the, the, the fact that you have the means to be able to make and alter and fix and repair things, and you have a place to do so. And it's simple stuff like this that I just kind of wanted to invite you guys along for the journey of many times the simpler things in the shop. And, uh... I don't know, I guess kind of have a wife-approved way of inviting a couple hundred thousand uh, people over to my shop to hang out. Also, interesting uh, design thing, not probably you know necessary on something like this, but why not just cut it at a, uh, a 90 right there and run my bandsaw in there? Uh, it's just design, I guess that's kind of my, my... And you're just, you're just el eliminating strain and stress. Uh, a sharp 90 degree, whether inside or outside corner, that's a lot of strain and stress at that, that, at that sharp point. Um, so being this is going to be sticking out and kind of be levered and could have the possibility to get tweaked in one different direction. I don't know, I just didn't want it to start splitting there. Necessary for something like this? No, but 
Uh, something to think about when you build other stuff. Now, I don't know how I know it, but this pot metal and these zinc coated fasteners, okay, that one was nice and loose. How about this one? Okay, well that, that essentially made me look like a fool. But a lot of times these get really just jammed in there. I don't know if it's the juxtaposition of metals or um, whatever robot they got to, you know, tightening them together is like NASCAR lug nut torque specs. But sometimes you'll have a, a, a cylindrical shaft screwdriver if you can get one that's a hexagonal or uh, even square at the base and you can get a wrench on there and essentially get a lot of torque, get pressure with that, uh, the screwdriver tip, the bit, whatever you're using. But what I was gonna get out before even checking these, cause I don't think I've ever had a set of these that were loose. Now granted, I picked these up online, so I don't know, maybe the road noise frequency adjust. But that way you can get a good grasp on this. Is that how the tool manufacturers want you to be using them? I don't know, but my shop, my tools. Okay, that was taken out so that we can essentially get a reference here of where those holes are to be located. But Nick, why not just drill a through hole here and then pick up the threads on the back side when you sandwich this together? Why go and drill these out further? Uh, mostly because I don't know what this exact thread pitch is. I don't have any longer screws like that. And mostly because I've, I've spent more money on my quarter 20 collection than I have probably on my kid's college tuition. So these holes need to be drilled out just a little bit bigger than a quarter inch because that's going to be a through hole that the screw is going to come through. And then our piece, uh, we need to mark exactly where those holes are and those need to be drilled and tapped for quarter 20. The only reason I'm using quarter 20 is because like I said, that's you know what I, I have a lot of. That's probably one of three different containers of various quarter 20 hardware. It saves on having to have three eighths and five sixteenths and just going through the line. Uh, if you at least can try and stick to one in cases like this, you can see that we can alter that. I don't need uh, a bunch of different length screws in this particular thread style. Uh, another thing too, I get, I used to get electrical tape in these little plastic containers. That makes a good spot to have your taps and your bits because uh, like a quarter 20 is actually a number seven bit. Metal that's a lot, you know, more finicky. Uh, this wood shouldn't be a big deal, but, and so writing that all on here, I know I what I have in there, but I also know if I am missing the bit, I don't have to look up what number it is. Sometimes it's hard to keep track of all that stuff, but that seems to help me out over the years. This uh, pot metal, or I don't know, I don't know if it's cast zinc or what it is, but um, it doesn't necessarily have to be some high-end drill bit. Take your time, it's gonna want, you're only enlarging it a little bit, it's gonna wanna kinda feed its way through, but. So now you can see that these quarter 20s will feed right through. And I have a little bit of, you know, I went a little bit larger, I think at 930 seconds. Yeah, it's 930 seconds. Uh, that just gives me a little bit of wiggle room uh, when I line these up and I don't have to be as exact. So now I'm gonna transfer over those hole locations and then drill and tap these into the maple with the quarter 20 set. And you know what I decided to do? Um, it's just kind of a layout thing. It's kind of goofy. You wanna set the gap of this particular radius along with this. You want you want essentially parallelism between those two. Uh, essentially these these two circles would be concentric. You don't want it uh, flat here and then. And all that was is just room in here to get the hose and then the non-actual worm drive of the, you know, I'll have the, the tightening mechanism over here. But um, so I'm just kind of eyeballing it from the top, uh, making sure that I have some bit of symmetry. Again, shop projects, not super important, but if you're thinking about how to overcome certain obstacles and um, then all of a sudden that comes to an actual project and your mind is already at least thinking on the problem solving type level. Problem solving type level. That's, that's completely got to be a legit word. Now, as I mentioned, you don't have to use in wood. Uh, in fact, you can go a hair smaller just because uh, a number seven bit and a quarter 20 is technically, uh, you know, for your metals, your aluminum, iron, mild steel, stuff like that. But I'm gonna show you a quick way to beef up those threads. And like I said, there's a reason I chose the maple. Maple takes a, a, a thread real well. I wouldn't necessarily do the same thing in a basswood, a pine, or like a balsa. But like I said, it takes a thread real well. 
But here, I'll show you a neat trick on how to beef up those threads even more. Take a thin or a medium, like CA glue, and you can actually squirt a little bit down in those threads, and those threads are gonna soak up a little bit of that CA. That is, if of course I can get it to squeeze out the end, right? All right, hopefully, there we go. Now we're cooking with gas. So anyways, just give a little shot of it and kind of use the nozzle, move it around, get those threads to kind of soak up. Sometimes it'll pour through like you see there. You could do it a lot less sloppily than me. Maybe even a little activator. And you should probably let it sit just a hair longer than I'm going to. You don't want to clog up your tap with half solidified CA. But then you can come back through and just kind of, you're almost, you're not necessarily re-tapping it, but you're almost just kind of reaming or chasing those threads. They're just a little bit stronger, but you get the idea. All right, so let's see if you can smell what I'm stepping in here. So we're gonna have our screw come all the way through here, and then it'll thread onto the wood here. Try and do that and show the camera is uh, two different things, but. Do as I say, not as I do. Should have let the CA set a little bit. So I'm just getting that out of the flute or the tap before it really solidifies. All right, back to screwing. All righty then. That moment that you contemplate, the time it'll take you to walk across the shop and grab a bit for your drill or how long it's gonna take you to hand screw them in. Life is full of mysteries. For the record, it would have been much quicker to go grab the bit. But, nice solid connection. I keep dropping that. A couple through holes, just quarter inch through holes, and then I'll bring that over to the bandsaw. All right, I only made the through holes for mounting an eighth of an inch, because I know that that's the exact size of my, my center punch. I'm um, just going to slide this magnetic holder down just so I can get a better kind of idea. I don't want any bit of this hose interfering higher than the table. Obviously, I have the spine here. You know, it's not like I'm going to have wide stuff, but I could have like a crescent shaped something. So I'm just kind of being a little bit mindful of that. And then just kind of leveling that out. My center punch isn't long enough to get a strike. So eighth inch drill bit it is. And I'm just breaking through the paint, essentially. Because uh, I might get wander, I didn't, luckily. But I got two small points. Before I go any further, I personally want to see, when I'm going to tap these for quarter 20, the quarter 20 is just going to have one or two threads past the metal. But I do want to take a peek in here to see if my power uh, supply is coming down this way, or you know, just look for any obstructions. Better safe than sorry. And there are actually wires in this particular model, but from what I could see, they were pretty much towards the back of the tube. I'll be mindful of that. I mean, I'm a good two, three inches away, but also I'm not gonna sit there and pop through the hole and then sit there and ream it out and, you know, tell. So anyways, we're just gonna try and poke our way through. There's that one. It would be smart to take away the uh, magnetic little tray when you're having chips pour down on it, but. That, and of course, I just realized that I had the, the eighth inch bit. Typically goes quicker when you drill a pilot anyways, because the larger bits, you're not necessarily cutting in the middle of those. No burr. Now we can go to mounting it. With those holes enlarged to the quarter inch, like I said, just about the thickness of the metal, plus a thread or two. And when that drill bit came through, it didn't feel like I hit anything bouncy like a wire or anything like that. But I'll put a washer on here as soon as I find one. <laughs> but that's a nice secure for as much as that hangs out eight inches. That's not too bad. But why don't we hook the hose up to it and see how it works. For those of you that might not know, a lot of these interchangeable bit uh, drivers, uh, the small, smaller standard is quarter inch, so you can essentially use that as a nut driver, or a lot of these interchangeable bit ones. In fact, you get these free with the coupon or whatever. Um, that works a lot on these 5 16 worm drive pipe clamps. 
All right, so we had that clearance built into the bracket. Can pretty much slide our dust collector hose over, tighten it up. All right, now I'm just showing off and just see. Again, that's just me dinking around, but it's a consistent, let's see here, 023, 024, 020, 023, 022, 022 and a half. Yeah, pretty darn consistent. Um, yeah. Anyways. So anyways, there you go. Pretty much a, a simple little, you know, dust collector blast gate bracket. It'd be perfect for a wall. I should make another one because my lathe, kind of the same situation. That blast gate is just sitting there in the middle of flexible hose and whatever. I'll, I'll leave that for another, you know, six month temporary project. I'll leave you with this. When I was setting up the camera, I noticed a neat little thing that I came up with. Uh, magnetic, uh, half of a paper towel holder, a magnetic one. Super strong magnets. You hang your bandsaw blades on there. Uh, I have the ones that need to be sharpened on the bottom. So I'll leave you guys with that tip for the day. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to spend some time in my shop. And hopefully you guys have a great day. And I'll catch you guys in the next one. And for the keen observers, this bracket, by the way, this mock-up that I had to redo because of my wardrobe malfunction. Um, yeah, it's backwards. So for a good chunk of the video, it's backwards. Well, don't make that one. But that was a temporary one. I got the good one right.